first event in the Quantum Server Open Webinar Series on Scientific Computing Applications. So this is a new initiative which I decided to start recently in order to allow researchers from all over the world to present and advertise their research on various computational science topics of a choice and as a result to foster collaborations and discussions between like-minded specialists in the field. Of course, this is a time when webinars and video conferencing are becoming very popular and convenient solutions for discussing things remotely between many people, and this is why I decided to hold these webinar presentations online using the Zoom program. Um, another important aspect to mention is that all these presentations will always be recorded by default and then uploaded on YouTube for even more visibility, so I hope everyone is fine with that. Um, at the end of the presentation, we will also have time for asking questions to the speakers and engage in a general discussion on the topic being presented. Okay, so before we start with today's webinar, I would like to first spend a couple of minutes introducing myself and my new startup company, Quantum 7 Networks, uh, as well as its various services and activities. So, my name is Gabriel Mogni, and I'm an Italian citizen, even though I grew up in Belgium for most of my life. Uh, and this is, in fact, where I'm still residing today. So I did my university and PhD in the UK, where I specialized in the atomistic and abinitial material science simulations, including DFT and classical MD techniques. Uh, and it was mostly for geophysics applications to study the phase transitions of alloy crystal structures under the high pressure effects of planetary interiors. Uh, so now I'm mostly working as a freelance scientist uh, and in fact one of my main interests is really to try and develop industrial and commercial applications of materials modeling uh, techniques, um, especially in order to try and make them more widely accessible by industry users and therefore beyond the purely academic research. Uh, my main activity at the moment actually consists in collaborating with a European organization uh, which is called the European Materials Modeling Council, or EMMC for short, uh, which has precisely the industrial development of materials modeling as its principal objective. Uh, in addition to all this, I also decided to start, uh, to try and start my own small company, which I called the Quantum 7 Actors in the end. And uh, it's really to try and establish a sort of social media platform that can bring together the community of computational scientists from all over the world and also to facilitate the exchange of ideas, discussions, and projects. Um, so what makes this quantum survey initiative quite unique, I believe, uh, is that it is truly interdisciplinary in the sense that anyone, uh, so anyone with a general background in scientific computing is welcome to join and participate, including, for example, people coming from the worlds of engineering, continuum, uh, material simulations, uh, also atomistic simulations, chemical and molecular simulations, bioinformatics, as well as computational fluid dynamics uh, and even quantum computing and other HPC technologies, if you want. So I will now share my screen uh, in order to show you what the quantum server website looks like roughly, uh, in case you haven't had a chance to take a look at it yet. Um, so let me exit this uh, and then open. Yeah, there it is. Um, so as you can see, our main general discussion platforms are based in the form of social media groups, both on Facebook and LinkedIn, as well as our websites. Um, as you can also see under this section of a website here, uh, one of our main activities uh, consists in uh, um, offering contract research services on all types of scientific simulations to clients from industry and academia or any other laboratory. Um, and uh, for this, I brought together a team of 18 expert consultants from all over the world uh, who are willing to work remotely on any proposed computational science topic. Um, and as you can see on this page, uh, you can find the uh, profiles and um, uh, CVs uh, of all these consultants in the rest of the page. So you are welcome to explore this at your own leisure and to browse through the profiles of all these consultants that you can see here. So in case you have um, any computational science project that you would like to discuss with one of several of these consultants in order to start a remote collaboration with them, uh, please feel free to send me an email and I will act as an intermediary in order to facilitate any communication or interaction between you and the consultants. And for this, uh, so my email is shown here. 
So it's gabriel.mockney, which is my name, at questcomputing.com. Um, and then, as you can see, the Quantum Server website also offers uh, many other services and links to other interesting resources and websites in the world of scientific computing, which, of course, you are welcome to explore at your own leisure. Um, and in particular, under this page, um, you will find more information on this open webinar series, including a list, a link to future events, and um, as well as a table when any, where anyone can register to give a presentation in the future, which you can access here. Uh, if you want to advertise your computational research to an audience of uh, interested specialists. So today is our first event in this open webinar series, and it will be our pleasure to have Dr. Tanvir Hussain from the University of Western Australia as our first guest speaker. Uh, the title of this talk today, as you can see here, oh, wait. Um, is uh, computational insights into functional materials for energy storage applications. And after the end of the talk, we'll then have time for some questions and general discussions if people want. So I will now let Tanvir start his presentation and share his own screen. Um, so Tanvir, over to you. I'll, I will just have to make you host and you will be ready to present. Okay, thank you very much, Gabriel. This is a fantastic initiative and it's a great platform for all of our early career or some, some of us might be senior researchers to present our work and uh, to attract uh, possible collaborations and uh, to make it uh, visible as much as possible. My name is Tanvir Hussain and I'm a senior research fellow. Uh, I was at the uh, University of Western Australia since last month, but I have just moved to the University of Queensland. So that's why I have put both of my affiliation over here. I'm a senior research fellow and uh, I'm a computational material scientist uh, working uh, in clean energy domain, some gas sensing, batteries, hydrogen, and these kind of stuff. So this is what we do here. This is a University of Western Australia on the river bank of, uh, uh, this is a small river in the, the beautiful city of Perth. Uh, the state is Western Australia and here is uh, our university or here was my university. And uh, here was a school where I was based at, the School of Molecular Sciences, right here, you can see. And what do we do? We work in a different domains. Uh, primarily, I work on a hydrogen storage by using uh, 1D, one-dimensional materials, two-dimensional and 3D materials. And then I work on metal ion batteries, all the type of metal ion batteries like lithium ion, sodium ion, potassium, magnesium, aluminum ion batteries. And recently we have started also metal sulfur batteries as well. And then uh, we do uh, gas sensing and uh, the gases includes uh, common pollutants, so volatile organic compounds, warfare gases, so all the type of gases we, we design sensor computationally by using 2D material. And uh, another area of our interest is single atom catalysis where we convert CO2 to other useful fuels like uh, CO2 reduction, CO oxidation, and nitrogen fixation. So these are the things we are interested in and we, we are doing uh, for quite a bit of time. So today I'll be mainly talking about uh, uh, clean energy storage. Uh, the first topic of my talk would be hydrogen storage and I briefly touch the energy profile and then uh, I'll tell you, you guys a little bit about hydrogen energy and uh, what are the problems associated with that and uh, what are the solution uh, to solve those problems associated with hydrogen storage and I'll present our recent uh, project which was on a boron graphidine we recently published that and the second part of the talk would be on batteries because that also falls into clean energy uh, domain so to briefly describe about the working principle and then uh, why sodium, why not lithium, what advantages of sodium ion batteries have over lithium ion batteries. And again, there is one example of graphidine as a node material for sodium ion batteries. And then at the end, I will summarize. So the first thing first, the energy profile. So currently, these are the resources of getting energy, so which are mainly non renewable which means like we are getting energy from oil, coal, natural gas, all of these are, uh, these are non-renewable. So once you use them, you're not going to get them back. 
So that's the one drawback. And the second one is they will finish one day. Of course, the more you use them, the, the sooner they will finish. And then uh, with an increasing population, so you will need more and more energy. So these are energy usages with, with the ear and they are creating lots of CO2. So even if we have unlimited supply of coal, natural gas, oil, still that is not good because that is creating so much of CO2, which is not good for the environment and for humans. So we want our earth to, to be like that, greener, not like this. So we need to move away from non-renewable to more cleaner, more efficient energy sources. And when I talk about cleaner, so there are many options and one of them is hydrogen. So the question is why only hydrogen? Because when you talk about the energy content of different sources, you see hydrogen is three times than the second best. So you get more energy when you use hydrogen as compared to all the other energy sources. And then carbon to hydrogen ratio, which means the pollution for hydrogen is negligibly small. It's perfectly clean. So there is no CO2 associated with the hydrogen as if we use hydrogen as energy. And then the safety issues, hydrogen bounce greater than all the other resources, which means if there is uh, some incident happen, for example, there's a filling station based on hydrogen, and if there's some uh, in accident happens on uh, uh, that filling station, the hydrogen would evaporate faster than the other. The other gasoline would stay on the ground and cause more damage as compared to hydrogen. And then the explosive energy of hydrogen is again lesser than the other. So more energy, less pollution and safe. So these are few salient features of hydrogen and how hydrogen is clean. So we started with water. So here this or red is oxygen and green are uh, hydrogen atoms. So there's the unlimited of water, like two third, three fourth of the uh, world is you know, water. So we break the water into hydrogen and oxygen. So this is our hydrogen. So we need to store it into some cylinder. So we are storing it over here. And then as we know, hydrogen has a valence electron. So that can be used as electricity to run our car or whatever you want to run. Again, this hydrogen combines with this oxygen to make water. So we started with water, we ended up with water and we have electricity to use in our cars, electric vehicles or planes or whatever you want to do. So that's very clean. But there's a bottleneck, bottleneck uh, with, associated with this hydrogen energy and that is its storage. So if you want to store one gram of hydrogen, you would need 11 liters at standard temperature and pressure. So your car would look like that. Of course, you don't want that. If we uh, uh, freeze it or liquefy that, you need a temperature of minus 250 Celsius, which is too low. So a lot of energy would go to achieve or and maintain this low temperature. Or if you want to compress it, you need very high pressure, which is of course not safe. But the material-based storage seems to be a viable option because the hydrogen is the smallest element of the periodic table. So it can sneak between the atoms of any material. So that would give an option of material-based hydrogen storage. But then the question comes, what type of material do we need for this hydrogen storage? Because there must be some condition for that material to be fulfilled to be a good hydrogen storage material. For that, we need to check the interaction of hydrogen with the materials. So this hydrogen molecules interact with this material, approaches to the surface of the material, dissociate it into hydrogen atoms, make strong board, uh, bonds with the host material, and this is metal hydrides. On the other hand, hydrogen approaches to the surface of the material, remain in the molecular form, no physical bonding, interact with the surface of the material with a weak binding. On my left, the binding is too strong and on my right, the binding is very weak. So both of these strategies are being used for hydrogen storage. Here on the left side, you need lots of energy to take out hydrogen to use in your electric vehicle. And here on the right side, sorry, on the left side, you need too much of energy. And on the right side, you need energy to keep hydrogen bonded with the material because you want appropriate bonding. You don't want too strong bonding and too weak bonding. So here, let's take the example of this because uh, the next example will be 
based on this type of uh, interaction. So here, hydrogen is interacting with the surface of the material, which means those material which has large surface area would be more beneficial for this type of bonding when it comes to surface area. So this class of material, 2D materials, and we have a two, like quite a few 2D materials now experimentally being synthesized. Of course, the graphene, the parent one, and then we have boron nitride, silicine, black phosphorine, different transition metal dichalcogenides. So all of these 2D materials has some fascinating properties. For example, they are one atom thick. They have large surface to volume ratio. They have strong direct charge transfer, they can be used in many, many applications. And here we are talking about hydrogen storage. So 2D materials could be good hydrogen storage medium. So let's see the example of this 2D material that's called boron graphidine, very recently synthesized a couple of years ago. So it's a graphene-like material. <clears throat> this browns are carbon atoms and this green is boron atoms. So unlike graphene, it has a bigger pores, but it's absolutely flat like graphene. This has some different properties than graphene because graphene does not have a band gap, but here we have a band gap. So it's a semiconductor. Very strong with the big pores. And uh, this could be used for hydrogen storage. But the thing is, like uh, in a pure form, if we use it as a hydrogen storage, the hydrogen interact with this material very weakly. As, I, as, as we discussed in the uh, uh, previous slide, the bonding should be appropriate. The bonding should not be very strong. The bonding of hydrogen with the host material should not be very strong and should not be very weak. So that there should be some intermediate range for that bonding. And that intermediate range is 0.15 EV to 0 0.60 EV. I should have written somewhere, sorry forgot that. So which means in the pure form, this is not good for hydrogen storage. So we need to increase the binding of hydrogen on this material. And there are many ways of doing that. And one of those ways is metal doping. So we can introduce different light metals. Here we have introduced lithium, <coughs> uh, sodium, uh, potassium and calcium. You can use more type I mean different types of dopants but we have restricted ourselves over here why because the <coughs> the the main motive is when you introduce this dopant they should stay dispersed on this monolayer they should not form form the cluster <coughs> like here it should be isolated lithium that should be isolated lithium this should be this should be isolated lithium same with sodium potassium and calcium once they form cluster then they are not good hydrogen storage material because then we don't have a reversibility so that's why we have considered these uh, <clears throat> light metals and uh, i mean how do you know that they don't form a cluster and they stay dispersed on the monolayer for that we need to calculate their bonding energies so here we have calculated the bonding energy <coughs> of single dopant, like this is lithium, sodium, potassium, and calcium, when they are two, when they are three, and when they are four. So these bonding energies should be stronger than their corresponding cohesive energies. So here I see, let's take the example of maximum doping, where we have four metal dopant over here. So let's take the example of lithium. <clears throat> so the metal binding in the binding energy over here is around 2 EV, you can see. Whereas the cohesive energy of lithium is minus 1.63, which means <clears throat> the binding is stronger than cohesive energy. And that is required. Similarly, for sodium, the binding energy you can see is one, minus 1.5 whereas the cohesive energy is 1.1. <clears throat> Similarly, the potassium and calcium. So in all the cases, <clears throat> I'm sorry, the metal binding energies are stronger than their corresponding cohesive energies, which means they would stay bonded where they are and they will not form clusters because when they form cluster, so we lose the diversity. And when they are bonded with the boron graphite and sheet, they transfer their charge to the sheet, <clears throat> which is evident over here. <clears throat> 
So this is charge accumulation, uh, uh, depletion, and this is charge accumulation. So we want them. Like it's it's a it's a desirable condition for these metal atoms to transfer their charge. Why? Because now they have partial positive charge <clears throat> because they have they have donated their charges to the sheet. When they are partial positive to the charge, so what do they do? When a hydrogen molecule approaches to them, <clears throat> they can polarize the hydrogen molecule and they can bind them through electrostatic interaction. So in the absence of these metal dopants, we did not have any charge. So because we did not have any charge, there was no polarization of hydrogen molecules. That's why hydrogen molecules were not bonded with this sheet. But now, because these metal cations, <clears throat> all of them, lithium, calcium, sodium, and potassium, and they are represented on the lithium and calcium, and the same sodium and potassium would do the same. So now they can polarize the upcoming hydrogen molecule <clears throat> and they can bind them through electrostatic interaction. So that is very desirable. So as we discussed, the bonding energy of hydrogen should be in appropriate range. That should not be too strong or too weak for efficient binding. So here, we have calculated the binding energy of hydrogen <clears throat> when uh, there are four hydrogen, eight hydrogen, 12 hydrogen, and 16 hydrogen. <clears throat> As I said, the ideal binding energy is between 0.15 to 0.6 eV <clears throat> electron volt. And here you can see, let's take the example of this in case of 16 hydrogen molecule the binding energy C, you can easily find that's more than 0.15 eV for all the cases, which means <clears throat> these metal dopant can adsorb multiple of hydrogen molecules with ideal binding energy. So to summarize, <clears throat> oh, sorry. So these calculations were at zero Kelvin at N1 atmosphere, but you know the fuel cell doesn't work at zero Kelvin or atmospheric pressure. For that, we need to have a physical pressure and temperature. So we have calculated these bindings at different temperatures and different pressures. <clears throat> and even different ranges of temperature and pressure, the hydrogen molecules stay connected with this metal top boron graphite and sheet. The target for <clears throat> ideal hydrogen storage system is 5.58%, whereas with the help of these metal dopants, we are getting 14, 11, 9, 9.10, uh, 9 and 9.8%. Now, what is this weight percent? This weight percent means 5.5% of the, uh, like, if the, if the weight of uh, your whole system is 100 kg, 5.5 kg should be hydrogen. So that's 5.58%. And in all the cases, we are crossing this target. <coughs> I'm sorry, so I have some problem in my throat. <clears throat> so to summarize, so material-based hydrogen storage is a viable option. And when we talk about material-based, 2D materials are promising hydrogen storage material. And in 2D materials, boron, graphite, dyne monolayers dopped with light metals are efficient hydrogen storage material because they can store a lot of hydrogen with appropriate bonding energies. So this is the first section of the, my talk. So here we have studied some other system like uh, C4N. We have also studied BN2 here, carbon nitride, C3N4 and c 3 and so different system we have studied for hydrogen storage. So all of these are 2D material and with these are recently published paper. <clears throat> so the next uh, topic of my talk is for rechargeable metal ion batteries. So the working principle of metal ion batteries is very simple. Here we have anode, here we have cathode. So from anode side, in case of lithium ion batteries, Lithium ions, <clears throat> when I say ions, which means the valence electron will move from the external circuit and lithium has a valence, one valence electron that would move from the external circuit and that will run your car or whatever devices you want to run. And lithium ions 
moves from a node to cathode when the battery discharges and when the battery charges the reverse will happen and same <clears throat> one electron will combine to the lithium and lithium will again move from cathode to anode when the battery charges so this is a simple uh, lithium ion batteries and it has many applications so you have batteries in almost everything like in your laptops cars mobile phones cameras and everywhere <clears throat> now lithium has limited reserve and it's quite expensive and the power density of lithium is also very limited so we should think beyond lithium so there are different options we have like uh, potassium sodium sodium ion batteries potassium ion batteries magnesium ion batteries calcium ion batteries the working principle is absolutely same it's just lithium uh, has uh, less resources and it's uh, not co cost effective so one day it will run like it will finish so we need to move away from lithium <clears throat> and uh, i mean it, it can be categorized batteries can be categorized in monovalent and divalent for example if you are using calcium so calcium has two electron if you use magnesium again magnesium has two electron two valence electron so lithium sodium and potassium they have single electron so the energy density will depend on the two valence electron so now sodium versus lithium why we need to go towards sodium ion batteries because of course the cost is cheaper because it's more in earth crust so 23000 parts per million for sodium compared to only 20 parts per million for lithium so of course it's more in abundance and it's cheaper but it's a bigger as well because it's the second element of that group after lithium to sodium so that 170 picometer it's its atomic radii <clears throat> which is perhaps is the problem because the electrode which works for lithium with this atomic radii that's 152 picometer would not work with for sodium so we need to come up with the different electrode or different set of sodium ion batteries <clears throat> for lithium we have a graphite which has been used for many many years so that is not good for sodium so we need to come up with different electrode material to make these sodium ion batteries so one of them is gdy it's an abbreviation of graphite ion so it has uh, <clears throat> uh, interlayered spacing of uh, 3.65 angstrom or 0.365 nanometer so that's a bigger interlayer spacing because in a battery you know like a lithium or sodium intercalate between the layers so we should have enough spacing between the layers so for graphite ion it's 335.335 nanometer or 3.35 angstrom and here it's a uh, 3.365 nanometer so that's more so <clears throat> so here it's a graphene graphene and graphite ion so this is the material uh, like we, we studied for sodium ion batteries. So here's the unit cell and here's the extended system. So that's look, it's a carbon based material. So it just looks like that with the small pores and bigger pores. So as I mentioned, it has a bigger interlayer spacing, <clears throat> but it has more area as well. So if you talk about graphene ring, the area is very small. If you talk about uh, GDY, you can see. So these are bigger rings. So the area is more. 5.5 times bigger than and this is a single layer and this is a bulk layer of graphite ion which we used for the sodium ion batteries <clears throat> the main thing is the binding the first thing so the binding of single sodium two three four and up to so on so the binding should be appropriate again the criteria is same they should not be clusters <clears throat> when the sodium interact with the sheet it should interact with appropriate bonding energy. At least the bonding energy should be stronger than the cohesive energy. So here we see in case of a single sodium, the bonding energy in this range 2.2, which is of course stronger than its cohesive energy because its cohesive energy is minus 1.10 EV. In case of two sodium, three, four, five, and up to this maximum, in all the cases, the bonding energy is stronger than the cohesive energy but this is the case with monolayer but in actual the system is not monolayer the system is layered we have many sheets so we have calculated also that 
So NI interaction with the bulk material, when we have <clears throat> practical, practical material, uh, like a bulk, bulk system. So in between that, the bonding is even more. In case of one, two, till 13 sodium, your bonding is quite strong, which is understandable because now sodium can interact with both the layers. And with this much of uh, uh, sodium content, we check the storage capacity here. So this is theoretical electrical capacity in case of uh, graphidine, that's a 454 milliampere R per gram. So that's milliampere R is like, uh, I mean, I mean this, this actually, actually you can understand this milliampere R means uh, this is amount of milliampere current this battery can give per hour, this per gram. So that is quite, quite reasonable. And in fact, it's quite, uh, it's quite higher than the graphite electrode. So this is the one thing, the binding and the storage capacity is one thing. The other thing is the lithium should <coughs> diffuse across the electrode. So the diffusion barrier should be quite low or quite weak. So the metal cations should move quite fast over the 2D material or any 2D material. And here in case of uh, this graphidine, we check the diffusion from here, small pore to big pore, like here, we need to uh, uh, spend energy of 0.13 EV, which is quite small. Here is 0.8 from this pore to this pore, this pore to pore, and here again, this pore to this pore is 0.47. So in all the cases, the except this one, this is 0.8 is a bit high from this pore to this pore. Otherwise here 0.13 and 0.039 here, or uh, here 0.46, uh, 0.47 EV is quite fast. So the diffusion is quite fast, bonding is appropriate, storage capacity is good, which means this GDY is a good anode material for sodium and batteries. To summarize that, sodium can intercalate in GDY layers because we have checked in a single layer and bulk. So this is the capacity for single layer for uh, almost 500 milliampere R per gram, but in case of bulk, which is actual material that 316, a bit smaller than graphite in case of a bulk. <clears throat> and the energy barriers uh, for single layer we have calculated that's quite fast. So except this one this 0 0.801 as is a bit on the higher side, but this 0 0.131 EV is quite fast comparable. So all, all of these uh, promising results show that GDY could be a very good anode material for sodium ion batteries. So other than so, uh, <clears throat> this GDY, we have studied graphene nanoribbons <clears throat> for sodium ion batteries. Uh, new materials, uh, silly graphene. Recently, we studied it for lithium and battery, and again, this multivalent ion batteries like magnesium, calcium, and zinc. We studied this defected graphene as an anode material. Again, defected graphene for calcium and batteries, and this is again sodium and batteries, and this uh, with the experimental collaborators recently published this paper. So these are some of the. Other, other studies which we have done on different type of batteries. So at the end, I would like to acknowledge uh, my collaborators, both at the University of Western Australia, University of Queensland, and uh, from Sweden, Korea, and Germany. And uh, these are supercomputing facilities, POSI, NCR, so we acknowledge them. And CDCMS is a computational <coughs> Uh, Center for Theoretical and Computational Molecular Sciences, which I'm a part of, that's a consortium at, at the University of Queensland. So thank you very much for your for, uh, patience. And uh, I would be happy to take as many questions as you guys can ask and uh, discussion. I'll take care of yes. the question and answer. Oh. Um, okay, so I see that you, there are a few hands raised. So I will start with... Uh, I will start with uh, Mr. Mishra. Um, yeah, I'm sorry about my throat. In fact, like I, I, I had this dry throat. And sorry. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, now you should be able to unmute yourself if you want to speak. Hello. Hello, yeah, we can hear you. Uh, uh, am I audible, sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, can, we can listen. Okay. Uh, this uh, sodium ion battery you presented uh, using that graphite in surface. Uh, so whether that is for battery application, we need the thermal stability, means it, uh, it will be stable at the room temperature condition. So whether this system is stable at finite temperature or is it um, kind of a zero Kelvin structure? Oh yeah, that, that's quite a good question. In fact, very good question. Yeah, it is stable. We have, we have done this molecular dynamic simulation at uh, even 400 Kelvin, so which is more than 100 Celsius. So it is stable, yeah. And at that higher temperature, uh, it is not forming the cluster because uh, there will be means at higher temperature, thermal energy will be higher and it has the tendency to form the cluster kind of arrangements. Yeah, so that's why we check the binding energy and compare it with the cohesive energies. And uh, in all the cases, the cohesive energies which were mo uh, much more stronger than their, uh, sorry, the binding energies were stronger than the cohesive energies. So that's why they, they were not uh, like uh, forming the clusters. So the sodium were like uniformly distributed. Just uh, one more, sir. Means uh, if you increase the coverage, you have shown no, that are like binding energy decreases. Cohesive energy mm -hmm. means binding energy decreases. So, mm -hmm. what will be the good uh, coverage range for the sodium ion battery? Because if you increase the temperature, also there is a tendency of thermal energy, and uh, with increase in also coverage, there is also possibility of uh, forming a and binding energy weakens. So, what will be the best for this material? Like, what will be the coverage value? So the best we have got is, as I presented, uh, uh, around 490 milliampere uh, uh, R per gram. So uh, <clears throat> 14 or 15 sodium, that's what we have got because we put more than that. But when we put more than that, the bonding energy becomes weaker than cohesive energy, which means the uh, clusters you, were, you are talking about. So we don't want that. So that was our limit. So we, you know, we kept on putting the sodium as long as the bonding is stronger than cohesive. And the maximum we have got is 14 or 15 sodium atoms on this supercell of graphite. Thank you. Okay, so that was the first question. Um, uh, sorry, by the way, Tamir, I see that there's someone, uh, Mr. Ajitsin, Aji, Aji sorry, for um, mispronouncing that, but he's asking you to provide the uh, links to the research papers mentioned in the presentation. So sure, sure, I will, I will, I will. I, I'm, I'm happy to even send the PDF. You just okay. So I think yeah. uh, no, not a problem at all. Yeah, if you get, get, can get in touch with him personally, then that would be the best solution. Yeah. Oh, okay, <laughs> no problem. Um. Okay, I see there are a few other hands raised. Uh, by the way, feel free to speak whenever you want to ask a question. You just need to unmute yourself first. Okay. Um, hello? Yeah, can we me? can hear you. Yeah. yeah. Hey, um, Tanvir, nice talk. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so, and so a couple of questions regarding your sodium ion battery calculation. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. um, so you were talking about your interlayer spacing. Is it possible to have an expanded interlayer spacing by artificially uh, incorporating polymeric systems? Yes, yes, that's a very good quest question and suggestion. Of course, it is possible because I think people have done that with the different carbon-based systems uh, with, uh, by using, of course, these organic molecules. So we can do that, yes. And that, that's exactly, you know, people, when, when they study graphene for sodium or potassium and battery, that's exactly they do. And that's exactly what we have done in some of the papers, you know, I presented. So you create defects, you put some uh, yeah. organic molecules between two layers and uh, you expand it. Okay. Um, another question. So you did mention about some MD calculations. Yes. That it was done in addition to the DFT calculation that we've shown. So um, did you try calculating like the diffusivity within the system? That's in how diffusive is the sodium ion within the system? 
in fact, we did MD uh, uh, because this GDY is a stable. It's a very stable at room temperature. So the question is when you put sodium, then whether it's a stable or not. Uh, exactly what, what was the question, you know, before someone asked. So we did MD on that and uh, uh, we uh, actually check the thermal stability only or dynamic stability by phonon calculation. So the diffusibility we uh, checked at zero Kelvin only, uh, the diffusion variance which I showed to you. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um. Hello. Am I audible? No. Yes. Yes. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, sir. Sir, I want to ask from the hydrogen storage material section uh, okay. that you tr uh, you tried with the lithium, potassium, sodium, and calcium. Uh, mm -hmm. So, on what basis you choose these uh, metals actually, but uh, not the early transition metals like scandium and titanium? That's again very good question. So, I'm I'm happy to listen to this uh, you know very interesting and question which 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 shows the you know. So you are presenting to experts. Okay, so the thing is, you know, uh, whatever you use that should stick to the material, that should bind to the material, which means the binding should be stronger than cohesive again. They should not form cluster because when they form cluster, then actually there are not four lithium. There are one lithium because that would be one lithium cluster and that lithium cluster can take, you know, few hydrogen. So that's the one thing, we don't want cluster. So if we had taken uh, titanium, actually we did that, or scandium, or even iron or copper. So those transition metals, they have higher value of cohesive energy, which means you need even more stronger binding to beat that cohesive. So unfortunately, those transition metals were not able to bond it strongly to that system at higher doping concentration. You can have one, uh, one uh, titanium bonded strongly, that's fine. And that one titanium could have absorbed six hydrogen. That's it. When you put another titanium, these two titanium would form a cluster. So that's why we have restricted ourselves to light alkali or alkaline metals. Okay, sir. Thank you. Okay, let's see if there are any other questions at this stage. Okay. Looks like uh, we run out of questions. Okay, in that case, I, I believe we can put an end to this uh, first uh, webinar. Uh, so I would like to thank you, Mr. Hussein for a very interesting presentation. And um, yeah, overall, it looks like it was a good uh, success uh, for a first uh, event. Uh, we had uh, over 20 people participating. So everything went uh, more or less according to plan. There were a few technical difficulties, but there was no big issue. Um, so thank you very much for participating. Uh, as I said in the beginning, uh, uh, all this presentation will be eventually uploaded on YouTube in the next couple of days. So you will be able to re-watch it in case you miss something, or you will, of course, be able also to get in touch with Mr. Hussein personally, because I will put his email address in the video description. Uh, okay, so thank you very much for participating and for listening. And I believe at this stage, we can put an end to this uh, webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.